and go heli skiing. Being stuck in a chairlift with Sean Connery, heli skiing must be the ultimate skiing experience. The idea of leaving fresh tracks in a Canadian mountain wilderness is a dream for most skiers, usually left unfulfilled due to lack of funds. But the snow show has absolutely tons of money, so we went to see what it was really like. To those of us in overpopulated Britain, Canada seems a bit unfair. Loads of mineral wealth, great ice hockey teams, spectacular scenery, and yet hardly anyone lives there. There's virtually nothing but trees, moose and elk. Oh, and the occasional helicopter. Almost as soon as helicopters were powerful and large enough to carry skis and packed lunches, enterprising Canadian mountaineers started offering trips into the virgin white wilderness for adventurous skiers. 30 years on, things are slightly more organised, though the concept remains the same. Well, there is no skiing like it in the world. And it's the best powder skiing available anywhere. I think that people that do come here, even if it's only once, they've realised the dream of a lifetime. Perhaps the most thrilling thing about heli skiing is the people who do it. Dangerous and dashing, flashier than Formula One, it truly is the pursuit of the young, dynamic, bronzed ski gods. Hold us back. It's what I live for. It's uh, the thrill of a lifetime every time. Hang on a minute. These people are old. And it's not the snow that's creaking, it's the replacement hip joints. So what happened to the rumours of heli skiing being the hangout of skiers from the planet Sex? I thought you had to be a really hot skier to come heli skiing. Well, generally that's the myth, uh, but the industry is changing because uh, generally the hot skiers, the ski bums of the world, don't have the cash to come heli skiing. So we see a lot more of the uh, the business execs come up, and uh, so those are the ones we're catering to now. You're no. saying you're saying, but you mean fat, not very good skiers. Well, yeah, I hope my boss isn't watching this, which he... Right here. Oh, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the fact that the heli-skiing lodges are set in some of the most romantic and wild areas of the known world, inside it's more like the function suite of a Rio Stackus hotel during a computer software sales convention. And the holiday company, Canadian Mountain Holidays, have absolutely no illusions at all about the skiing standards of their desk-bound clients and respectfully suggest in their brochure that guests leave their own expensive, high-performance skis at home. The in-house range of short, soft and fat skis are a little easier on the knees and a lot easier on the ego. A fatter ski is generally keeps you up more in the snow. Mm -hmm. So people, when you start sinking, if you're heavier, say you're a little heavier. You know, a heavier athletic build. Uh, you might <laughs> sink too, the, heavier, the heavier. You might sink a bit more in the snow, which makes life difficult because when you're trying to turn and your skis are getting crossed and all that stuff. Do you want to show me your fattest ski? My fattest ski. <laughs> this, Just in case I need it. This is my fattest <laughs> ski. The atomic. It's like a snowboard. There's hardly a ski. Aye, uh, lass, it is. It's quite <laughs> fat. Um, it, the idea is quite similar to a mono ski, so if you have two of them. And you can see the bindings a little bit on the inside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so basically you ride them like a mono ski, but you have two of them. It's a leg saver, these things. Big guys that are uh, maybe not so trim, love them. The lodge wakes up to the nervous swishing of nylon leisure wear as clients coax their joints into action. So just how good a skier do you have to be? If you're a strong intermediate, meaning you can get down most runs at your local hill without difficulty then you probably wouldn't have any trouble with heli skiing. I'm gonna leave this party now. now, if you're beginning to think I could do that and you reckon you could bear the idea of being trapped in a lodge discussing tax-deductible investments, then stand by. This is what it costs. Depending on the season, anywhere from between about uh, $3,000 to $4,000 round figures, not including the airfare to come from wherever you live. 
and we guarantee you 100,000 vertical feet of skiing. But towards the end of a week, you might have skied your 100,000 feet. And then after that, we charge $40 per 1,000 meters. In other words, the better the weather conditions, the more extra flying you do. And the more extra flying you do, the more it costs. So unless you fancy spending the remainder of your holiday sunbathing back at the lodge, take that gold American Express card with you and be prepared to use it. With the meter constantly running, vertical footage is posted against names each morning like vital statistics at a Weight Watchers convention. But hey, what do they care? They're loaded. We come for to get the ultimate experience, the full week of skiing. And if you have to pay extra footage, which you hope you do, meaning that you get good skiing, that's what you do. Let's see, return flights to Glasgow, plus the $3,000 to $4,000, plus up to $2,000 on excess runs, is the old Ferrari syndrome. By the time you can afford one, you're too old to drive it. This is my million foot suit. I got it last year, about six months after I had my bypass, and uh, that was kind of exciting for me. Now, do you have to save up like for a million years to get a trip like this, or is it just your, well, your yearly holiday for you? Uh, we call it the million dollar suit because that's what it costs. Uh, but I'm one of the lucky ones. I don't have to save too long to get it. Is it good value for money, do you think? Oh, I do not know. I have to ask my husband. <laughs> oh, he pays? Yeah, he pays. Um, <laughs> would, you, would you like to be introduced to me? <laughs> OK, it costs a fortune and your fellow guests may make you long for the wit and charm of a life insurance salesman, but the heli-skiing experience is nothing short of breathtaking. It's private, it's exclusive, you don't have to queue, and you get lots of goes in a helicopter. After skiing here, going to a ski hill is just kind of a waste of time. You could spend an afternoon there and then it's kind of boring. It's the ultimate. It's the best skiing there is in the world. lucky to actually have on the show any moment one of the pioneers, the earliest pioneers in fact of heli skiing. In fact that's just him arriving now. Norman love it everybody. Norman. Thank Hello. you. Both. Hello and come away in out of that very inclement weather and enjoy there. the hospitality of the snow <coughs> <coughs> Shelley. Now. Thank you very much. One of the earliest <laughs> pioneers of heli skiing, uh, so I believe. And so how exactly did that start? I mean, how long ago did heli skiing begin? Quite a long time ago. Goes back quite a long way in that sense. Qu quite a long way. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Just, just, just quite a long way. Fair way back. A fair quite way a back. fair way back. And then yeah. how did you get involved, Norman? Because I, mean, I think a lot of people watching would be very surprised that you were one of the pioneers. You know, you're not, mm. you don't really come across as, a, you know, as a, maybe a top athlete. Um, you know, people tend more to think well, of you in the comedy yeah. line, really. Yeah, well, in that area, talking about comedy, you do have to be quite an athlete, really. And I suppose the early comedians inspired me. And some of them, uh, I believe, Laurel and Hardy did some skiing as well, some heli skiing. But helicopters when weren't they were invented. Filming. But when weren't they were around, no, no. I mean, I mean, or how... perhaps they used lorries then. You know, kept it on the ground more. Well, that would that would be very different, considerably different from heli skiing. Can, can we just talk yeah. about the lorry technicalities skiing. of heli skiing? Yeah. I mean, when you first started, I mean, was there danger of avalanche? I mean, where did you you pick to go? I mean. <sighs> Tried to work where there weren't any danger mm -hmm. of that uh, avalanches and things. Um, it's mainly good snowy areas. What year was this? Um, that goes back quite a few years. A few around, years. Yeah, around 1972 or something was it? Something like that. But heli skiing started in the 60s, Norman. 60, uh, 68. 68. That's it. You've never been heli skiing, have you? You've never been heli skiing? No. Who said that Norman Lovett was a pioneer of heli skiing? I mean, how, how did you get on this show? I mean, I just, it's, a snow, it's the snow show, it's about it's skiing. It's just that my series is on the same channel and, you know, I thought I'd come on and give it a mention, you know. Well, I just don't take kindly to it, that's all. I want to do skiing in the future, though. <laughs> I would like to. 
I learned to ski. It was quite difficult. Watch this. I'm sorry. I am very sorry about it. So, uh, what is it? Are we going to learn anyway at the top here? Well, today I think we'll do a wee bit on poles. Poles? Like, like people from Eastern Europe? No, no, no. These things are going dangling to your hands there. Can't be that much to learn about, about poles, George. Well, I don't know. I think I could take a few bob off you in the next few days about poles, you know? <laughs> What's wrong with my poles? Oh, we'll soon find out. Muriel uses her poles like a parkey. That's why her rhythm is totally short and her timing is appalling. Oh, dear God. <laughs> First of all, Over get the stance right. OK. Now, put your hands out until you can see them in the periphery of your vision. Look ahead. Mm -hmm. Open your hands out a wee bit. Open the hands slightly. Mm -hmm. That's it. But when you're turning, you've always got to concentrate on keeping your hands in a good forward position all the time. Right. They have to be there all the time. The minute your hands drop back, then the body drops back well, as well. Can I just ask you this then? I mean, for instance, it's, it's perfectly possible to ski down without poles. I mean, perfectly possible, just using your arms to balance yourself. Mm. What is the purpose of them? The pole will give you better timing, better balance throughout all your skiing movements. So you're saying that the, the pole plan is the timing for the turn? It is part and parcel of the timing for the turn. It actually supports you when you cross over. You make a lateral movement from one edge to another, the pole can support you for a fraction of a second here and a tricky position. Right, and you're, you're suggesting, nay, you're absolutely insisting that I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Now keep the hands held forward, palms slightly turned out. You should be flexible and relaxed in your stance with hands out in front. Don't get hung up with any of these rules about carrying a tray of drinks or riding a bike. Just get comfortable with the poles in the periphery of your vision. Then it's simply a wrist action. You'd think skiing was difficult or something. Yeah, I learned, I learned a lot there, George, a, a lot. I mean, I imagine things will improve from now on, so perhaps you'd like to show us how you do it. OK, let's show you then. Oh, yeah, poetry in motion. Plant turn, plant turn. Man and mountain in perfect harmony. Travelling quickly like this and initiating lots of turns. The pole becomes absolutely crucial in helping me go from one edge to the other while keeping my upper body calm. Good pole use is actually very simple. It's just stabbing the ground with a pointed stick. Oh, very good. Learned a lot about poles. That was great, George. Yeah, that is, by the way. So would you say that pole discipline is as important as everything else in skiing? Absolutely critical. Is there any chance then now I've had my lessons that I might be able to use my poles well and efficiently? Oh, absolutely. No doubt about it at all. Oh, great, great. And I'm Dame Margot Fontaine. Well, it's not all play in the snow show, shall I? I am required to do a little bit of work each week, and that involves going through the mailbag from the viewers. But I enjoy it, so keep those letters coming. What's this one? Dear Occupier, oh, I would start with a circular. Your name has been selected from millions of householders to become a member of the British Olympic ski team. Please tick the box alongside the event you'd like to appear in. Slalom, downhill, or ski jump. RSVP training starts a week on Thursday. Please bring your own skis. Junk mail. What's this one? This is from a Mrs. Foldswood. Dear Muriel, I think these so-called safety bindings are a right con. I fell over a 50-foot cliff and still broke my arms and legs. It's quality stuff so far. <laughs> Dear Muriel, are your viewers interested in celebrity lookalikes? Yes, we are. We're very, very interested in celebrity lookalikes. If you think you're one, this is the place to write to. All my friends say I am the spitting image of that wonderful sports commentator, David Vine. What do you think? Well, that comes from Mrs. Betty Aykroyd. And yes, I think, Mrs. Aykroyd, you bear an uncanny resemblance to our top ski commentator. Back to the slopes. No matter how good you are on the piece, there's something out there waiting to get you. The trick is to show no fear. You and your ego are just going to have to fight this thing together. Moguls.
the skinhead of the ski hill, the Ned of the nursery slopes, moguls are to intermediate skiing what Hannibal Lecter is to vegetarians. Always attracting bad boys and ski bums, in the 1992 Winter Olympics, their notoriety was further enhanced as even top ski guru David Vine had to admit he was perplexed. How do you ski down a course like this, all these bumps like that? So we set out to find out how the good skiers tackle them. Not technical advice, but mighty mogul truths they picked up along the way. First up, the Canadian Junior Mogul Team. You have to be a little nuts, a little crazy. You gotta have a fire inside that makes you just wanna go faster and jump higher. You want everything below your waist moving all the time. And uh, you keep your head still, you keep everything down below moving. As long as your eyes are up, you can look at the girls on the chair and make sure you're doing it right. <laughs> I think the best thing is to uh, to keep eyes up because uh, if you have your eyes up, you can go fast, you can control your speed and everything. I tend to agree with Stefan, keeping the eyes up and everything usually follows. Is it too late for someone as old as me to learn how to mogul ski? It's never too late to learn how to mogul ski. <laughs> Well, that's a relief, but we're not going to learn much hanging out with these guys. Like most sportsmen, they can do it, but they can't tell you how they do it. What's worse, they probably listen to Brian Adams. Happily advice is available at $200 a clinic from Rick Bowie, ex-Canadian freestyle team member. And when we say ex, we mean ex. You make me feel so young. As you get older, it gets a little tougher to bend and absorb the bumps, which is the key. You have to keep your hands in front because that keeps your body weight forward. And once you're forward, everything can work together. As Soon as you get back, you get in trouble. All right, we see. It's the old do as I say, not do as I do routine, eh, Rick? But he is an expert on some things. OK, well, give us a clinic on falling with grace and style, then. Well, the only thing you can do is you get up after the yard sale and say, thank you very much, I'm still in one piece, and you're here to ski and have fun the next day. You make me feel so spring has sprung And every time I see you Well, if you still think Rick's advice is worth a week's wages, then here's another golden crumb from Mr Bowie's table of knowledge. A common problem that most people have as they're skiing down the bumps, they lose it on their third turn and traverse across the hill like they're riding the wild pony. And then it's one of these. Oh, I'm going to turn left here. Oh, no, I'm not. So the key is the head, you have to focus down the hill. Well, the main thing that Rick taught us was that if you're fortish and thin on top, you should take up darts. So in desperation, we turned to mogul, mystic and ski bum Andy Stafford. He'll tell you all he knows for the price of a drink. Four things about mogul skiing. First, most important thing is like keeping your head up and looking ahead. You see so many people just looking down at their feet. The second thing, probably most important, is your hands. You've got to have your hands right out in front. Keeps your balance nicely on the ski. Third thing, breathing. You've got to be careful as you come over the top, you can't sit back. You don't, you don't want to defecate, you want to push your hips forward and fornicate. That's the most important thing. Fornicate, not defecate. Yeah, let him run. At last, a man who speaks plain English. Never mind knees, eyes, poles or angulation. It's <laughs> don't <laughs> And who said sportsmen can't be philosophers? Thank you. <laughs> San Moritz is probably the most famous ski resort in the world. It was a spa town in the 19th century until the British upper classes discovered that they could have as much fun squandering their inheritances in winter here as they could in summer. And although the sun has thankfully set on the great British Empire, here in San Moritz there's one small outpost which will be forever England. I'm running at the bottom of the wall, picking up speed so fast, oh, into South Park. Oh, 
And this is where the Union Jack still flutters optimistically over a long tunnel of sheet ice where gentlemen come to join the Cresta Club. My name's Ron Diggle and I've been doing this business for about the last 40 years on and off. Well, I don't know how I'll get on. I'm trying a new toboggan for the very first time. I think you go round one corner right, and another corner right, I think it's a very, very nasty day. The Cresta run famous the world over for epitomising the speed and thrill of winter sports was in true alpine tradition started by the Brits. The run was built first in 1885, mm -hmm. and then, of course, was a very much more um, primitive, um, almost to put like a toboggan down a road, and gradually the um, banks were built more carefully. And next came the traditional Swiss okay. clubhouse. This is an old cricket pavilion made by um, Bolton and Paul, brought over from England. So how did you get it over um, here? Oh, by ship and rail. And... and they're even kind enough to let Johnny Swiss join in. You know, our national character is rather very serious and so, and, uh, and it cheers us up. It gives us some oxygen for the rest of the year when we mingle with the British. And uh, rather delightful, and uh, well, we just love it. You'd never know the club was in Switzerland and run as it is like an English public school sports day, with orders being barked out at members over the tannoid by the formidable Colonel Willoughby. I've got even tougher this year because we had a group of beginners who came out and they had a little, they ignored my advice, and I'm very tough with them. Well, the first chapter hospital wasn't bad, he just broke his arm in three places, but the second chap had a kidney removed. So that is exactly why I am tough. I mean, one chap downstairs described you as a, as a prep school headmaster. I mean, you are, you are quite intimidating. What's wrong with head, prep school headmasters? Damn fine people. They produce quite a few decent British people. <laughs> quite, and exactly the sort of good eggs they want as members. So if you haven't been to prep school, you can always try pretending you have. <laughs> which just might help you blend in amongst the chaps. Now, the snow show takes you places you've never been before, and today we're in the hallowed halls of the changing room of the Cresta Club. <laughs> this is the Cresta Club. Oh, what are you doing? No, I'm sorry. No, absolutely not. But, no, but why? No, I'm sorry. I'm from television. Yes, you're welcome to apply for membership, unless you're a woman, because this isn't just a sporting club, this is a gentleman's sporting club. Ladies were stopped in the 1920s, and though I wasn't around at the time, this was done on, on medical grounds because the crossbar of an old-fashioned toboggan does come straight across your chest and the run used to be a lot, a lot bumpier and you really did. I mean, even the days I remember back in the 1940s and 50s, you really did have very large bruises across your chest fairly permanently. But that's only if you was like Samantha Fox. I mean, I wouldn't have any trouble at all. I, mean, I think, I think you're it would be very difficult me. to have a rule that ladies, whether or not ladies could be elected depended upon their um, vital statistics, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, surely all that cushioning stops you from being bruised. Well, this was... I can't be expected to justify or not the decisions made in the 1920s. <laughs> Well, girls, you're probably not too upset that you can't sample the odour of old army underpants, or indeed join these fellows who've come from every corner of the House of Lords to compete in the annual Seniors' Cup. Welcome to Cresta Sedalias. <laughs> there are a lot of very good riders in this, uh, although they're all over 50. You know, some very good... I mean, Nino Bibia's just gone now as a former sort of Olympic, you know, he won the Olympic gold medal in 48. I mean, a, so a lot of very good riders. So you have to have a, a kind of regime the night before, like a boxer before well, a fight, like no drink or anything like that? No, no, no. The more the, more the merrier, usually. Can I feel your heart? <laughs> and this is what it's all about. For those of you without titles or testicles, here's a glimpse of what these gentlemen gladiators get so excited about. I'm starting off down the Johnson Strait. I'm picking up speed very rapidly now. I'm coming into rise. This is the easy bit. These are easy ones. I'm coming into rise. I'm fairly low in rise. I'm coming into battle picking up speed very fast now. Into shuttlecock. Oh, no. Pushing like mad in shuttlecock. Run shuttlecock. Into stream. Down. Down the, down the street. Burning speed rapidly now. Holding off the banks. Coming into profits on the left hand side. Flat out, flat out now, 70 miles an hour, and, and, and the sir, clear this, down the crest to leap, 80 miles an hour, approaching finish, pushing finish, through finish, through finish, on the finishing back, trying to, 
going to rest now. We've made it. Thank God that's over. Thank God that's over. Well, despite the good humour of these decent British chaps, the Cresta Run is actually quite dangerous, and with brittle old bones travelling at 70 miles per hour inches above the ice, well, accidents will happen. Well, that's the most notorious part of the course, called the Shuttlecock, and this viewing platform is called, rather aptly, the Vulture Pit. But, of course, we wouldn't like to stand here and watch the cream of English gentlemen come to grief there, would we? <laughs> As you come along here, you want, to, you want to get right up towards those bushes. If you're here, you're going to be in trouble. I was going too fast. I lost control in the shuttlecock. I mean, you must realise how dangerous it is now. I mean, would you ever ride again? Oh, yes, I'll be here next year. But you could die. Well, it's best to get hold of you. So what is it that makes these dear old gents leave the security of their home counties, travel all the way to Switzerland just to dress up like their head gardeners and risk grazing their family jewels on the Cresta Run? It's just a marvellous atmosphere, wonderful amateur sport. No sort of smells, no noise. We had one man who went down naked once, that was quite amusing. The Cresta Club is public school without matron, the army without bully beef, a homestead from Hampstead, but most of all a cosy reminder that for a few weeks a year, a chap can be in chap heaven. As soon as I leave here, um, when I staunch the ghastly financial hemorrhage, I then start looking forward to coming out again next year. Still here, Norman? Yeah, I'm just waiting for my helicopter. Your helicopter? Yeah. Sure you are. Well, next week we go extreme skiing in Chamonix and we also travel to Utah, the Mormon skiing capital of the USA, and we're involved in a very nasty avalanche. And we'll probably have on some guests who will tell the truth, <laughs> guests who won't stoop to deception to get onto the show, guests who can be trusted. Where is it then, Norman? I don't see your helicopter. Yeah, it'll be landing over there in a minute. Over oh, there. It's just a bit late, yeah. that's all. Mm -hmm. Not much sign of it so far. You usually hear these things coming over a great distance, can't Pretty you? Pretty quiet engine. Yeah. Quite a modern helicopter. Yeah. So you can see for a, for a long way from the chalet, and I don't see any, any sign of anything. Oh, it just appear from nowhere. It's, it's a white helicopter. Will it? Yeah. Very Will quiet it? and white. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Beer in a minute. Yeah. Don't hear it. <laughs> 